the most celebrated graphic novel ever. Watchmen. Now the Watchmen characters in the DC Universe come together for the first time in the most anticipated story in years. DC proudly presents Doomsday Clock. Jeff Johns. Gary Frank. A 12-issue comic book series. Get issue number one at a comic shop near you. Hi, everybody. Oh, hey. How's everybody's Comic-Con? Great? Uh, I'd like to uh, everyone to introduce you to Freddie Williams. What are we working on today? Uh, this sketch is... Oh, it actually picks up pretty good. Um, yeah, it looks great. Thanks. I'm working on a Wonder Woman head sketch, um, and I figure I'm going to try to get this inked, and so that maybe we can give it away as a, as a little freebie, a little giveaway for some trivia or something later. That sounds good. At the end of this, we're going to give this sketch away. Sound good? All right. So, Freddie, <laughs> tell me, how do you start? You're from Missouri, right? Yes. How do you start from Missouri and end up at D.C.? Um, yeah, it, back when I was a kid, back in the long, long time ago, back before the Internet for mm -hmm. the most part, most people had to live either in New York or in California to get a job doing comic book stuff. And um, so the, for the most part, it was difficult if you lived in the Midwest or someplace else. But nowadays, you can live anywhere really with the Internet. But specifically, how I got started was actually here in San Diego Con in 2005, uh, there was a, um, a talent search, a portfolio review um, that DC Comics was running, and I submitted my portfolio, and to my uh, delight and total shock, I was selected to be reviewed the next day, um, and that review went really well, and I started working. That was in 2005, so I've been working now for, at uh, DC Comics, primarily DC, for uh, since late 2005. That's so. amazing. It, it, so, so it is possible amazing. to get in the front door. I, I didn't know anyone before that, and it's uh, I'm very lucky to be doing that. And uh, because we can live anywhere now in the in in the world, really, and just upload stuff through uh, FTPs or something like that, high res files, then you know I can live near my family and and not have to move away. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit about. Uh, Batman and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Yay! Two of my favorite things growing up. Me too. I uh, did a, a crossover. Can you tell me uh, how did you tackle these iconic characters? Yeah, I, uh, let's see, first of all, I am so super lucky. My, my editor, Jim Chadwick, um, if he ever hears or see the, sees this, I'm, I give him so many thanks because he he basically uh, made it made that work. He's the editor for the project for Batman Ninja Turtles, and I just so happened to be sending him some, you know, some uh, Ninja Turtles stuff around that time, and he really liked it, and so that's how I, I got connected with it. But um, at the very big beginning of the project, uh, so this would have been in, I guess, mid-2015, mm -hmm. um, when we knew that the project was going to be happening later that year, I had a few months before we were ready to get rolling in the production, so I took the time and I started creating style guides or what are also called visual reference profiles. Um, basically, I just wanted to create a specific look, a very definitive look that every time I drew uh, any of the cast, so all four of the Turtles, Splinter, Batman, Damian, Robin, um, Nightwing, any, any character that existed in, the, in that story, I, I wanted to make sure that I was on model, so to speak. So I spent time and drew on 11 by 17, um, like a full body shot and a couple of different face shots um, so that I could really focus on the head shapes, especially of the turtles, to make them, you know, all four of their faces sort of distinctively different. Uh, Matea Santaluco, who's the cur uh, current artist for the Ninja Turtle series, is doing an excellent job, but I, I, I heavily reference the Kevin Eastman, Peter Laird era of turtles. Um, and basically, that's it. I just created style guides for all of them and made sure that I always was on model for not just their costume, but their head shape and stuff, too. I mean, yeah, you did great. You have characters from two different universes, and they all look like they belonged in the same place. Like, Thank it you. looked fantastic. Thanks. Did you have a favorite Ninja Turtle that you were drawing? Oh, yeah. Um, let's see. My favorite Ninja Turtle ever is definitely Leo. Um, but I have to admit, coming up with <laughs> different you know, head shapes and stuff. I ended up really liking 
uh, to draw Raphael the most. Right, so it's right. it's kind of it's it's almost a mixed answer. Leo's my favorite, but Raphael ended up being my favorite to draw. Michelangelo has always been my favorite. You d he was great. <laughs> yeah, he's uh, super fun. He was fun, like all his mannerisms, everything in that. He was able to like keep his comical feel to him the whole time. Yeah, the whole the whole point with him is that he's almost like a goofy version. He, he's kind of like if you took Robin, like a, uh, I don't know, like a, the youngest version of the Tim Drake or the youngest version of the um, Dick Grayson Robin, and you made them even goofier or something. It's like that, that nice counterpoint to the more serious characters that are on the team. Um, it's really fun to, to have that kind of tension breaker and stuff. I think my favorite is when he was riding the, uh, the Tyrannosaurus Rex. What was that? He was riding on the back of the Transformers oh, yeah. Rex in the Batcave. <laughs> yes, yeah, there's a scene in the Batcave where basically the Ninja Turtles find a way to get into the Batcave. They're in there without Batman knowing it. Batman's upstairs, or Bruce Wayne's upstairs talking to, uh, oh, spoiler alert, if you guys didn't know that <laughs> Batman and Bruce Wayne were the same. But um, basically Alfred and, and Bruce are upstairs talking, and then the alarm goes off because there's intruders. And when they come down, you know, he's catching them all infesting his back cave, <laughs> including Mikey is just riding on the back of the the tri the uh, the T Rex, and he's yeah. having a great time with it. So, oh, she's looking great. So here I've just been laying out um, just the, the the sort of contour inks, uh, and now I'm using a much thicker brush marker, uh, covering up some of my mistakes. I made the top of the TR a little too tall. Uh, so now no one can ever tell that that was too tall. Um, and just lying in uh, some shadows and helping to define the edge of her face. And if you're, you know, if I was working at home in the studio, we use a lot more um, like dip brush and dip pen so that you can use a brush and really load it full of a bunch of India ink and then just lather it on or slather it on. And um, just some, even though this isn't like a how to draw type discussion necessarily. I just want to point out that like whenever I was younger, um, I would look at this fantastic line art specifically by, you know, Jim Lee would have drawn uh, something that Scott Williams inks. And so I'd look at this confident, beautiful, you know, brush strokes and tech pen sort of line art that Scott Williams was doing. And I just assumed that comic book artists started at, you know, from a blank page with no under sketch and just started drawing like the perfect face um, or and knew exactly how to do it with no mistakes and um, for the most part that's not that's not true uh, usually we do you know all comic most comic book artists and, and animation if you ever look at keyframe animations and some of those uh, Disney books or um, Hanna-Barbera books or something you'll see you know very labored over pencils to get their shapes correct and the proportion and the anatomy and stuff like that correct so it's, um, it's pretty frequent that you're just scribbling on the page, and I call that scribble sketching, and you lay down, you know, in, in pencil, you're laying down a million lines and just looking for the right ones that kind of speak to you. And then after that, you keep reinforcing those lines and erasing out the, the weaker ones. And with uh, comic books, we have the luxury of it going to ink, so then all of the uh, pencil lines get erased. And in animation, they go to, well, hand-drawn animation back in the old days, they would go to the celluloid and then it would get, you know, sort of traced out in, in paint so that it, all everything would get cleaned up. So don't be afraid to, if, if you're drawing and you look at your favorite artists and everything just looks so confident and beautiful, try not to let that discourage you too much. Um, they, they have tons and tons of bad sketches that no one's seen. They have sketches that were bad and then they fixed it. That's just how things go. So just keep at it. Can you say that in the past couple of years there's been a trend of like what is, it, more, what is the question? Oh, would you say that in the past couple of years there's been more of a trend of like I've been noticing more and more that there's not many like that like you don't see inkers anymore. You just see like the penciler. Yeah. So the question was, is there a trend more and more nowadays to see? fewer inkers. And yes, that is the trend. And I think, you know, un it's an unfortunate trend because a, a good inker who, you know, can focus primarily or entirely on line weight, clarity, and can fix some of the, the penciler's mistakes if the penciler was too fast to draw something or just got something wrong, um, the lack of that sometimes can create a much worse drawing 
if, it, if there is no inker involved. The reason for this is because it's a combination of being able to tighten, you know, or to darken really clean pencils. If a penciler is very clean and tight, then um, you can just scan it in and darken it up and then call it inks. Um, or it might be because of digital work and some, some artists will just be 100% digital and since they're drawing the line anyway, they just keep it in black. Um, and also other artists who, uh, and I would, I would be included in this, this category, that I either do my own inks or I work in ink wash so there is no room for another inker to work, unless it's my wife helps me with inks. She knows how to ink pretty well. She helps me fill in black areas and do textures and stuff like that in ink wash. So um, that is a trend. Uh, back, when, back when comic books were printed in only CMYK in the... Um, back whenever the, the plates were really basic and stuff, you needed a really thick sort of ink line to hold to, just in case there was a registration problem. And that's when having you know, an inker was really extra necessary. But then inking became an, an art form in and of itself, and then printing technology kind of overtook it. So inkers are kind of getting lost in the, in the shuffle. So yeah, good question. Did that answer your question? Yes, it did. <laughs> it's very thorough. Uh, and the question was, what's my advice when using ink wash? Yes, like what, like what are some like, like tips about using it? Yeah, some tips about using ink wash. Um, so the first thing is that usually uh, I'll, I'll get like four different jars, one for light, medium, heavy, and then extra heavy ink wash. And um, what that means is, you know, we use India ink, which is 100% black. It's archive safe, acid free ink. and. If you dilute that with water, it gets lighter. And so I'm just explaining this for anyone who doesn't use ink wash. Um, so what I'll do is get four different jars. And so with the light ink wash, I'll put just a little bit of ink, but a lot of water. And then you get all the way to the extra heavy and it's mostly ink with just a little bit of water to uh, kind of water it down. So I would suggest mixing your stuff and getting your values done ahead of time. That way you're not frustrated later on on the final page by that. Um, and then the next thing I would recommend is to work on maybe four or five pages at a time. That way, while you're, you, you've laid down ink wash on, on one page, you can set it aside to dry, but you're not just waiting for that to dry. You can now go to the next page. And uh, I, I work on at least four pages at a time. Uh, sometimes I work on as many as six. Um, it also helps with if you're feeling kind of scatterbrained that day. There's something about just always hopping to another page can sometimes be refreshing. And um, let's see, ink wash, other recommendations. Uh, don't be afraid to try other, you know, try a sponge or try some, uh, try a paper towel. You know, in certain textures, it can give you kind of a rock texture or something. Do you, do you ever, like, when you're using the ink, um, ink, like, um, ink wash, like, use, like, white, like, like, if you ever, like, oh, I need to, like, add, like, like, I should have, like, you, like, could, you make a mistake and, like, you, you use a, Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the question is, what about using white as, uh, as correction or also for an ink wash itself? Um, I've never used specifically white watercolor. I have used um, different types of acrylic white ink. Specifically, there's one called Deleter ink. Um, there's also Pro White. And there's one called FW, which are my initials, FW. Uh, but that's not the one I use. Um, those can be used as is. They can also be diluted with water and um, can can be kind of used as a as an ink wash in itself, but you're using it for white. Uh, the the disadvantage is that it kind of has a milky sort of looking texture whenever it dries. So it's not it's not perfect. It doesn't perfectly align with the ink wash stuff, but it works pretty well. Thanks, Freddie. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a favorite oh, cool. DC character to work yeah. on? Oh, um, like, I think Batman is probably the perfect character to draw. Which, speaking of which, I'm gonna I'm gonna switch over to draw on a Batman. Um, Batman, no matter what part of Batman you look look at, so no matter if you show show like a close up of his belt or his gloves or his boot or something, he basically is designed perfectly. You know, right. you can always tell it's Batman, no matter the the angle or even if he's all in just shadow, you know exactly who it is. Um, so I think he's probably the perfectly designed character, and um, but my f my favorite character ever is is Superman. Okay. He's um, 
whenever I was growing up, he was very like my. Uh, we we grew up as with a single parent, so it was just my my mom and then my sister and I. And Superman always felt like a kind of a surrogate father figure to me. Got so it. getting to draw him was was actually a pretty cool emotional experience when I got to draw him for the first time, which was in um, an issue of The Flash, and then shortly after that, I did a fill-in issue of uh, Blue Beetle, and both of those it was kind of a a cool feeling as if I was getting to visit with my father, who you know yeah. I had almost no memories of. It was weird. Do you have a preference of superheroes over villains? Of I'm sorry. Superhero superheroes over villains. Like the, who would I who like, would I like more? Well, do you more? have a preference as far because the mannerisms are so different? Oh yeah. And the um, body language. Yeah, there's there's a lot of power uh, and and sort of like a dark arrogance that you can get into with a character like Darkseid or. Mm -hmm. You know, or you can go the complete opposite route and just go absolutely over the top with, uh, you know, with the Joker. The, so there, there's definitely a range, but I don't think I have a preference of one over the other. It's fun just getting to draw all of it, you know. Um, I can only imagine. Yeah, so that you, you have the full variety of them and not really cutting yourself off from anything. So in, in issue five, I'm sorry, issue five and six of uh, Batman Ninja Turtles, there was, you know, like... Um, not to spoil it for anyone who hasn't read it, uh, but there's, you know, Shredder and Ra's al Ghul have brought the mutagen into Arkham Asylum, so they've mutated a whole bunch of the iconic DC villains into different, you know, like uh, Mr. Freeze is a polar bear and, you know, Poison Ivy is a praying mantis and all this stuff. So it was interesting. That was one of the most interesting and fun experiments I've ever done because I was trying to draw characters I'm not used to drawing and their mannerisms, but also drawing them... In a completely new form. Yeah, in different animals. So, of course, that's going to affect the pose of the character. They might be hunched over more. Right. Like, Bane was an elephant, so mm -hmm. he was even more hunched over. Um, all that was a really fun experience. Thank you. Thanks very much. <laughs> yeah, there was a... Just for everyone to know, there was a, uh, a follow-up crossover... A Batman and the Ninja Turtles that uh, IDW put out that was called Batman Ninja Turtle Adventures, drawn by a good friend of mine named John Simariva, and um, that was an excellent series as well. It's, it's more lighthearted than the one that we did, but if you haven't checked it out, that was a, an excellent series as well. And like he and I are really close friends, and we had nothing to do with who they decided to draw it or whatever. Really? So we were just like, we're like the Batman Ninja Turtle buddies. So we'll be doing some conventions later in the year. Like uh, we're doing Baltimore, then. Um, Megacon Tampa and then New York Comic Con all back to back in like the same month. And that's going to be really fun because we'll be the Ninja Turtle, Batman Ninja Turtle guys. How amazing is your life, Freddie? <laughs> well, that's really cool. It's, it's awesome. The, the only real negative about drawing comic books, honestly, is just the amount of time investment. Because if you want to draw comic books and you're not like a savant mm -hmm. who, who knows how to draw it all correct all the time and, and not make mistakes, then there's a big time commitment involved, but you know my wife and I have pretty much built our life around that, and it, that part is is really fun. So it's the two of us in the studio all day working together, and uh, you know living over the artwork inside of the artwork. It's great. That's awesome. How's everybody doing? Feeling good? Yeah. Yeah. You have a question? <laughs> sure. Let me go. Who who is the most difficult DC um, character to to draw for you? the most difficult DC character for you to draw? What are the most fun DC no, the, characters? the most difficult. Oh, the most difficult. Do you have um, difficulties with anyone? Because you get to put your difficult. own style kind of into this DC character. Yeah, but there, there has been... Because um, I, I did like a six-issue run of on Green Arrow, and um, uh, part of that guest starred the new 52 version of Hawkman, who, if you've seen him, he is just covered in ornate, cool-looking armor. And that's awesome when you draw him the first time, and then you draw him the second time, and then by the third, you're like, oh my god, I've got to draw this guy like a hundred more times in this issue. And um, so that was, that was probably the most difficult off the top of my head, just because of all the ornate armor and wings, and he had like claws on his arm and stuff. Um, so I'll, I'll stick with that answer for now. <laughs> we have about five more minutes. And five more minutes? We only have five more oh minutes. Oh my gosh. <laughs> the pressure's on now. He's coming together so beautifully, though. Um, so after, at the end of this, we're going to do a trivia question, and then we're going to give the sketches away. Is anyone excited about that? Because everybody looks really excited. Does anyone have any more questions? A question that will take me 10 minutes to answer. That way I have a little bit longer to finish this drawing. 
<laughs> they'll they'll right. run me off stage. Let's do. Let's see. We did, you want to talk about the the He-Man Thundercat crossover? Oh yes, yeah. Um, okay, so. This is where I definitely say I'm probably the luckiest guy. This is definitely the luckiest part of my life, or I'm the luckiest guy in comics. Um, because, first of all, I got to draw Batman Ninja Turtles, which is just, like, two of the coolest sort of, you know, properties on, on the planet. And then on the, uh, right after that, um, I had asked if there was ever going to be a He-Man Thundercats crossover. I asked my editor that, and he said, you know, at the time it was very top secret, and, and they actually had been talking about it. And so I was lucky that I just happened to ask about it at the right time. And when I was eight years old, there's, I don't have a lot of childhood photos of myself, but there is this one photo where I'm sitting and I Please have got... Please tell me you're He-Man. Are you dressed as He-Man? Go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> well, I wasn't dressed as He-Man, but uh, no, but there was, a, I had lined up on the coffee table. Um, you know, I had like the, I think I had Lino. I had two Tigras. I had like three slides, but then I also had... He-Man and four Skeletors and like all this stuff all lined up and stuff. Um, so there was quite a few years there where it was like the default gift for any of my family to get me would be either He-Man or Thundercats. And so that was whenever I was about eight or nine or something mm -hmm. like that. And um, so getting to draw that was like getting to revisit my childhood in some cool way. It, it's hard to describe, but it was, it was really fun. There was multiple times throughout the the, the drawing of that, that I would look over at my wife, Kiki, and say, can you believe I'm getting to draw this kind of stuff? It's, it's you know, it's, it was really trippy to get to draw, but um, it just came out in trade paperback, um, so it has all six of the, uh, the issues from the limited uh, series, it was a mini series, and then it also has, I did, um, in the same way that I did uh, style guides or visual reference profiles for Batman Ninja Turtles, I did the same thing for He-Man Thundercats, mm -hmm. so I did, um, because it was so much bigger, I think I did like 20 of them. So there was like s single character shots and then also team characters. And um, those are all reprinted in the trade as well. So if, if you guys are interested to, to check it out, at least pick up the, the comment or the, the trade and flip through it to see if it's, if it's something that you'd like to check out more. I think we're going to have to wrap it up. We're going to do the trivia question. And it, it's going to be, let's go back to the Ninja Turtles. Does anyone remember Freddy's favorite Ninja Turtle to draw? To draw. To draw. To draw. Is it good? Is it right, Freddy? Is it Raph? To, to draw is Raph. Yes, to draw was Raph. Yeah. Yes. All right. And we're going to have two pieces, so what's the other? So who? So should we give them first choice on which one they would want? Sure. Okay. Uh, so we got to do another trivia then. Okay. So the, do you want to give them first choice on either of these two and then do the, the trivia for the second one? Sure. Do you want Batman? The Batman? Okay. Okay. Um, no. <laughs> Absolutely. I I have to ask the question first. <laughs> let's, see. Um, let's see. What was the favorite DC superhero to draw for Freddy? I think I saw you over here first. What was that? Superman. Superman. Yep. That's right. Okay. So I'm you guys almost, are awesome. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks thank for paying you, attention. Thanks for the questions. Thank, thank you, you so much. <laughs> thank you.